All right, welcome everybody back to the uh, Ceph Day track here. Uh, we're going to keep moving along with another Ceph FS talk, <laughs> or, or pieces of Ceph FS, I guess. The, uh, the snapshots for fun and profit. We're going to talk about all the various snapshot mechanics that exist within Ceph, whether that's the block device, the FS, or the, uh, or the gateway. So there are all kinds of options. And uh, Greg Farnham here is going to give the presentation. He's a longtime core developer of Ceph. Uh, so I'll let him take it from here. Hey, everybody. Is that mic well? OK, cool. Um, so this talk is Ceph Snapshots for Fun and Profit. My name is Greg Farnham. I'm a principal software engineer at Red Hat. I've been working on the project for almost eight years now. Can't believe it. So during this talk, we're going to go through the origin of snapshots and, and Ceph, because that's important for some of the design decisions that have been made. We're going to look at how rights work inside of the OSD and how the snapshotting systems interact with those rights. We'll look at how snapshots work at a higher level in the RBD and CephFS systems. We'll look at how the snapshot trimming works inside of the OSD. We'll look at some ways to control that and throttle it and the consequences of the implementation. And we'll look at some use cases. When I was practicing this earlier, the talk was a little short when I was just like talking through it. But hopefully, this one is more understandable. The last time I gave this talk, it was a little too hard to follow. So please, if you have any questions, like raise your hands or jump up and down or something because we should have enough time for Q&A while we're going through. So Ceph started out at the UC Santa Cruz Storage Research Systems Center. They were, it was a long-term research project. They were trying to build a successor to the Lustre HPC file system. Um, it was, some of the research was sponsored by the National Labs, Sandia and Lawrence Livermore, as they were setting up Lustre for the first time and realizing like, wow, this has some downsides. We'd like to not have those downsides. Things in the Ceph project have changed a bit since then. There's a lot of open source and hardware companies that are contributing to the project. It's a lot more cloud focused. That's why we're all here. Most customers are working in virtual block devices, RBD, or in the S3 and Swift um, Rados gateway interfaces. But about a year ago at the, at the OpenStack Austin Summit, the Ceph community was really proud to announce that we had a stable CephFS file system upstream. And so some of the vendors are now starting to, to push that down to some of their customers as well. If you've ever seen a Ceph talk, you've probably seen this slide. The Ceph project starts off with the reliable autonomic distributed object store that sort of provide, that provides the um, data durability and consistency mecha me mechanics. On top of that, we build you know, various interfaces, a full file system with a metadata server and, some, and a custom client, the Rados block device, which is just uh, a client library that sits inside of Kimu or inside of the, the Linux kernel and, and other systems, or a Rados gateway proxy that speaks S3 and Swift to the outside world and turns that into internal Rados operations for itself. Snapshots were initially envisioned, as with the rest of the project, as a thing in, set, in the set file system. And they, they were designed to be really easy. Every directory in CephFS has a hidden .snap directory inside of it. If you want to make a snapshot of that directory and everything underneath it, you just create a directory inside of the .snapdir. So it's just a make dir .snap slash my new snap. And then everything underneath that has a new snapshot that you can reference through the .snap directory, .my new snap, and see the files at the state when you created the snapshot. That was, that was a big goal, was that you could do this with arbitrary subtrees. You didn't need to specify that a, file, that a directory was special before you made a snapshot. You didn't need to create the directory in some special way. You didn't need to do sub-volumes and things. It was just we wanted to work with any directory in the system, your home dir, the ad, like as a user, the administrator taking a snapshot of every home dir or at the root of the file system or whatever. It would all just work. Because of that and, and the user accessibility and the fact that in HPC applications, when people are taking snapshots, it might be a 1,000 nodes all doing it at once. Those snapshots needed to be cheap to create. But we did have one big advantage over some systems, which is that we have intelligent clients. The CephFS client is pretty smart. It does a lot of work. The RBD client, not that we knew about it then, but today the RBD client is pretty smart and does a lot of work. So the, so the clients can coordinate the snapshotting across OSDs. We don't need to flood all the OSDs with a, with a synchronous message, message system that says, hey, there's this new snapshot that applies to these objects. And indeed, when Sage sat down with that system and worked out the first design, then we took advantage of that. Snapshots in Rados are actually per object. So to the OSD, all it knows is that there's a snapshot, you know, snapshot 72, and it has this object in it. 
and he might later find out that you know it's got a second object, but he doesn't know. Oh, hey, there's this new snapshot 72, and it has these 17,000 objects. Those, and that's because the the snapshotting is driven on object write. When snapshot, when you take a snapshot in the Ceph file system, then it applies to the whole directory and everything underneath it. Or if you take a snapshot of an RBD volume, it applies to all the objects in the RBD volume. But we don't go out and touch those objects right away. We just, when we have a write to them, then we send along a little bit of metadata that says, hey, you're part of this snapshot 72. And that means this data is pretty skinny. Every, every object, there's a list of the snapshots it's part of. And we have a list of snapshots that have been deleted in the cluster. That broadly makes sense. No one's screaming too hard. Oh. Yeah, it actually it actually works with, with any data that has been put into the system. But if you bring that up later, we'll we'll get to the file system and we can talk about it a little more. Just as a reminder, if we're going to ask questions, please use the microphones. We are recording this for posterity. The question was if this works with CephFS on open files, and the answer is yes. But we're not going to talk about too much detail. So in Rados, in the OSD, just normal writes without snapshots involved. You have object storage daemons. You probably already know this. Right now, those consist of a user space daemon that talks to an XFS file system. There's a new thing coming called Blue Store that manages disks directly, and that's going to have a lot of advantages that is, is being pushed forward. But most of this talk is going to focus on the, file, on, on the file store on XFS, because that's what most people have. It's the most battle tuned. It's what it's the only one thing that a lot of vendors are, are, are supporting right now. So in terms of the network, when you have a, a raw Rados client that wants to write something, it says, hey, I've got this object foo. I want to write to it. So it says, hey, like the client says, OK, I find the, found the primary for this object foo, and I want you to write this data. And it just sends a message to the primary OSD. The primary OSD sends that, sends that message to, to all the replicas for, project, for object foo. And then it sends back an act to the client when they've been committed to disk. Inside of the OSD, there's a couple different things that need to happen. It needs to look up the current object state to make sure that the client's allowed to touch that object, that the object actually exists if it's not doing an object create, to see if it needs to change the size of the object or whatever. So that's one disk I.O. if that data isn't cached. It packages up the right data for its replicas and for its local files, local storage system. And then it sends that to the replicas over the network and to its local storage system to persist. And that's, you know, depending on the file system, on, on what the file system feels like doing right now, that's about one disk access. You'll notice that here I am ignoring the journal that you probably know about in the file store because we're more interested in sort of the, the throughput rate of the backing hard drive. So in Rados, when we're snapshotting a single object, along with that, snapshots in Rados are identified by just a single 64-bit number. They don't have names as far as Rados is concerned. They don't have any metadata associated with them except the fact that they have been allocated. We call these snapshots self-managed because we're bad at naming, but also because for CephFS and for RBD, they're sort of managing the metadata about the snapshot. CephFS is responsible for knowing which objects are in, snaps, are in this particular snapshot 42. It's not the responsibility of Rados or anything like that. So to allocate a self-managed snapshot, snapshot, the client just says to, to the monitor, hey, I want a new snapshot ID. And the monitor does, uh, does what we call a Paxos commit round, and it, and it allocates one internally between its, its cons highly consistent and available quorum and writes that down to disk. And then it says, OK, client, here's a new snapshot. And as far as Rados is concerned, that's it. There's now a snapshot. It's not associated with anything except that it exists, but that's, that's all it takes to, to do the logical creation. Now, the client probably actually has some data it wants in the snapshot. So at some later point, it says, OK, I have this object foo, let's call it, that is in my, that is in my snapshot I got, which is just snapshot 42. And so now I'm writing new data to, to object foo. And so he says, um, says, sends a message to the primary that says, hey, write the state object foo. Oh, and by the way, I know that object foo is a member of snapshot 42. And the primary gets that, and it sends it off to the replicas and back, and everything's happy. Internally, Rados, the OSD looks up object foo. And that's about one disk IO. It says, oh, hey, object foo isn't in snapshot 42 yet that I know about. So I'd better make a copy of its current state and say that that's snapshot 42. 
And so that's a, a clone operation. In, in XFS, that's a full copy of the, of the object. And in Blue Store, it, it's just a little bit of metadata gets scribbled down because Blue Store is controlling the block allocation. And so in XFS, you're copying the 4 megabyte object and applying the, the new write, write in memory. And then we also need to record in the OSD a look aside table that says, hey, we, ha we know that there exists a snapshot 42 that has object foo in it, and also we have an object foo that is in snapshot 42. And you want the bi-directional lookup so that we can do things like trimming, which we'll get to in a moment. Graphically, well, OK, sorry. So graphically, we the disk state as it exists is we have this, this object foo. And it's got sort of an X adder which contains its info. And we say, hey, I want you to look up the, in I need to look up the info, so please read this X adder out of XFS for me. And we get it back from the client, or not from the client, but from our file system. And then we say, hey, XFS, we need you to copy object foo into this new location. And um, I think what that actually looks like is rename, yeah, I don't remember. We, we copy it into a new location, we overwrite it. So we say, hey, clone the object, write this new data to the newly cloned object, and record the snapshot. And so that goes into the file system, and it says, hey, we now have the foo snapshot version one, and this object foo, which has the new overwritten data. And also, in a level DB instance that we use to provide a whole lot of things, then we've written down these, these, the, these two key value pairs from snapshot to foo and from foo to snapshot. And that can get coalesced mostly into one commit if the file system feels like at the time, it might be a couple more, it depends. And then we say, hey, the file system did this, you can, you can have it back now, and you're done. So that's sort of the local path. And you'll notice, you know, depending on what the file system feels like, it might be two IOs, it could be more if, depending on how many folders it decides it needs to look, it needs to go do lookups in or to update or whatever at the time. So at a higher level in RVD, from its perspective, let's look at writes and snapshots. The Rados block device stores virtual disks. You're probably broadly familiar with it. Visually, you've got, most of the time, you've got the libRBD library running inside of Kimu and providing the disk services to its VMs. It might also be a kernel client or whatever. And then that library just talks directly to the OSDs to do what it needs to do. When you take a snapshot in RBD, you're running a simple operation, which I have later. I think it's RBD create snapshot ID on this object, then the client goes to the monitor and says, hey, I need a snap ID. And the monitor goes to disk and says, here's the snap ID. And then the client needs to write down on what we call an RBD header object that's responsible for saying, hey, we have this object, or th this RBD volume, it exists. It is of size 10 gigabytes, things like, and, and it supports these features. It also has a field in there for what snapshots exist in the, in, on the RBD volume. And so we write down on the RBD header volume, hey, you're a member of, I like 42, of snapshot 42. But it doesn't need to go out to any of the data objects. Later on, when you're writing to the RBD volume, for some other reason, then you say, hey, by the way, you're a member of snapshot 42, because it says so in, the, in your RBD header. And that goes through the same path as it does with Rados. But, more, but importantly, that can be in parallel. Like there's no serialization or, 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 or synchronization across the objects that requires any kind of ordering. It's just every time we do an I.O. in parallel or sequentially, every I.O. has that, by the way, you remember object 42 and the OSDs take care of it on their own. And so the right path looks the same and it doesn't really do anything from the client's perspective. So it's pretty simple. In CephFS, not hugely different. We do have a metadata server that sits in between the OSDs and the client in order to provide file system namespace operations like saying, hey, I need you to create this directory or rename it or create an, or allocate a new item number. And so the client goes to those to do that, but then when it wants to write actual file data, it just talks directly to the right OSDs for those with the objects that, that, with the objects that are a part of that file. When you want to, and so sort of graphically, it says, hey, MDS, I want to open this, this file greg slash dot git config for write, and the MDS says, okay, here it is, and the client then writes out, you know, the new version of my git config out to an OSD. If I want to make a snapshot of my home directory, the client says to the MDS, hey, I want you to make a snapshot in slash home slash greg dot snap slash my snapshot, and the MDS will 
has its own you know, MDS log that it journals to, and so it, and so it persists that, hey, there's now a snapshot in slash home slash Greg. And then it responds to the client, OK, you've got a new snapshot. It's got snap ID 42. And then when I later on, or maybe it's happening at the time, but when I later on say, hey, I want to open and write the .git config file in Greg's home dir, then the MDS says, here's, the, here's how you open the file. And then the client sends off the new, the new data to the object and says, by the way, this object is a member of object 42. And again, that happens in parallel. You go to the MDS to open files, and the MDS tells you that it's a member, that the file is a member of whatever snapshots it's in. And then whenever you go talk to the OSDs, you just set that up. So sequential, or it's not, it's not serialized. It's just all in parallel with whatever files you have to be doing. This could be you know, one big file that, has, that you're writing to three objects at once on, because you're doing, oh dear, because you're doing 16 megabyte streaming IOs. It could be three very small four kilobyte files. It just all happens naturally. So that's how snapshots get created. Any questions? Oh, one in the middle. Yeah, that'd be good, sorry. I'll go first then. Sure. Uh, you mentioned for when it's writing objects for Rados, it uh, has a bi-directional thing and it writes it to a database after a write. Where does that database live? So every OSD daemon um, provides three different sort of data streams or forks on an object. You've got X adders and the object byte stream and what we call OMAP or object map. It's a key value store. In the OSD, that's implemented with LevelDB or RocksDB, if you're familiar with those. So it's, it's, not, it's not a SQL thing. It's just a, just a key value store that you can list and re read in and out of. And we use that for providing the OMAP implementation. We use that for doing for um, some of our internal metadata like this snap mapper thing. Um, in the normal course of doing business on a write, you actually don't, talk, don't do anything with it. But it is sort of a thing that's being worked on in the background all the time. And so there is a cost associated with writing into it, but it's, it's sort of an ongoing thing you pay. It's not a, for this op, we created an IO. It's like, for these 50 ops, we created a four kilobyte write to disk. Thank you. Yep. Does replicating begin as soon as the OSD starts downloading data? Uh, yeah. So re replication happens sort of parallel with the local write to disk. Uh, what we call the primary OSD gets a write, and it puts it through some processing. And once it's sort of approved it and ordered it with respect to other writes, then it simultaneously sends it off over the network to its replicas and, and gives it to its local storage to, to persist. Thank you. Yep. OK. So we've seen that create. Oh, one more. Sorry. Yep. Um, so at what time do you acknowledge the write after all the replicas are done, or when the first one is written? Writes are always acknowledged after it's been committed to every OSD in the system. That's important for our consistency results. Then it means that you never get into split brain situations with Ceph. Okay. Um, the next question was that uh, when any kind of a write is done, you write some kind of a journal, and given the fact that you're using XFS, which is also a journaling file system. So aren't you taking like a double hit for writing journals for every yeah. IO request? Yeah, we can talk about that afterwards. That's part of the reason that there's this new blue store thing I've been alluding to, is that it handles the disk directly, and so we remove the double, the double logging. Okay, but that's you. not something we can really talk about right now. OK, so we've seen that creating snapshots is pretty cheap. As with many systems, what you don't pay up front, you have to pay later on. And in Ceph, then the cost is paid when deleting snapshots. Now, I'm going to talk a lot about sort of, sort of negatively about the cost here. I want to be very clear. CEP is, is really very efficient about snapshots. It's clean. It, it defers work and batches it together reasonably nicely. But we, because we are, we are data light on the front end when we're doing the creates, we have to be a little data heavier on the back end. Back end. Um, so when you delete a snapshot, logically, the client actually just sends a message to the monitor saying, hey, I want to delete snapshot 42. And the monitor writes that down and sends back an act saying, OK, snapshot 42 is gone. And the way it sort of persists that and shares that information with the cluster is in the OSD map that, sh that records what OSDs exist and various other cluster metadata and that everyone sees. And it just has a, a field called deleted snapshots or something. And you add it into that, and it's an efficient representation. It's not one for every, for every snapshot. You it's not an integer for every snapshot you delete. But it's basically, it's, it's what we call an interval set. 
And so it goes into here and it says, okay, all done. Now, that's just the logical deletion. Once you delete it logically, you will never see data associated with snapshot 42 again from the client side, but it's still sitting on the servers taking up space, which obviously you don't want it to do because you want that space back. So on the OSD, it gets a new OSD map and it says, oh hey, this OSD map has a deleted snapshot. I'm gonna put that deleted snapshot into my queue of things to trim. And then as it works its way through that, through that snap trimming queue, it will list the objects that are in the snapshot it will, for each of the objects, unlink the clone for that snapshot in XFS. It will update the, the object's main info, say, info X adder that contains the metadata about the object, and it will remove the, the level DB snap mapper entries for that object in snap pair. Visually, let's say we've been a little more ambitious. We've now got three objects that are in snapshot one. And we've got an OSD map that says, hey, you need to delete snapshot one. So this snap trimmer is now running through and it says, all right, I need to delete snapshot one. What's the next object that's in snapshot one? And the answer comes back, oh, hey, it's foo. And so the OSD says, hey, XFS, I need you to remove this foo one object. I need you to update the info on foo to say that it doesn't have a foo one object. And I need you to remove the keys out of, out of the snap mapper level DB instance. And so XFS and level DB change their instances. Level D crosses out the, the entries, XFS has a new info and is removed, removed to foo1, and it says, okay, I'm done. And again, snap trimmer goes, hey, what's the next snapshot one object? And this time it's bar, we walk through the same process for bar, does it again, what's the, what's the next object? It's baz, walk through the same process for baz. And then we're done and we say, hey, what's the next snapshot one object? And we go, oh, there isn't one and maybe we're now deleting snapshot two or maybe we're just done and the snap trimming can stop for a while. So, you know, frequently that's about two IOs per object in a snap. You need to go look up the X adder and you need to go, and, and then you need to write out the X adder and the unlink and the, the snap map or level DB entries are just getting coalesced into the sort of background work that's going on. Um, sometimes it can be a lot more. Sometimes XFS doesn't have any of the metadata and entry in memory, so it needs to go through. Sometimes XFS has journaled up that it's still unlinked 50 or 50 files, and then you give it a 51st one, and it's like, oh, like no, I need to go actually unlink things out of out of out of the out of the folders that I have in have in other places on the hard drive. So it's a little unpredictable when scheduling. This is a lot better in Blue Store because all the metadata in Blue Store is just coalescible into into the level DB instance, and so it's sort of an amortized lookup and then an amortized write out of, of the new instances of the keys. And in particular, Ceph has historically had problems with throttling these trim operations because of the way that work that we think XFS has done where it says, hey, all right, I've unlinked this file, is not actually done inside of XFS and so it just pops up later on as much more work. So the snap trimming in XFS is, or in Rados is very important, the ways that you control it. In Hammer, sort of the classic, the classic version of snap trimming that people who have used it a lot have had some trouble with, but that had its, the first sort of rudimentary controls, there were, there were two main switches. You could change the maximum number of snap trims that it would be doing at a time, that is the number um, that every PG in the OSD would be giving to X, the number of files that every PG in the OSD would be giving XFS to remove at once. And so you could say, oh hey, like, you'll have a lot of PGs, but let's say you have 30 PGs that you're primary for, so you'll be giving your XFS with, with the defaults, you'll be giving it 60 things to, to remove at once. So that's a lot, but you know, it's sort of okay. And, but some people found out that it wasn't okay at all. So we also had this thing called the snap trim sleep. And with the snap trim sleep, then after every time the OSD gives XFS two things to delete, then it sleeps for this number of seconds. Defaults to off, but a lot of people have turned it from, have tuned it from 10 milliseconds up to like five or 10 seconds even because they didn't have very many objects, but they just needed it to be very, very background. In the Jewel release, we made a lot of improvements. We moved the snap trimming from its own se sort of separate worker pool of threads where it just contended in the disk layer with client IO into what we call a unified op queue where client IO goes in, snap trimming goes in, backfill and recovery go in all through the same, all through the same 
um, set of threads and the same queue so that we can prioritize them and say, okay, like given the cost of doing all these operations and their priority to the, to the administrator, what order do we want to go in? And so with that one, you can, we can set the snap trim priority. It defaults to five, which is pretty low. Clients are 63, which is sort of the max. You can specify how expensive you want to consider a snap trim to be, and it defaults to being one megabyte of cost, which, some, which frequently is a little more expensive than it needs to be, but sometimes it's not quite enough. Um, you can still specify the concurrent snap trims, and you can still specify the snap trim sleep, but this was really embarrassing because if you turned it on, then you actually blocked the op thread that client.io went through whenever you did it. And so you could set a snap trim sleep of a half second and then no IO would happen for a second, including all your clients, and it was bad. So you shouldn't do that. But someone pointed out this bug and we did fix it. It's in the upcoming 10.2.8 release. And it also has a few new things. In addition to making snap trim sleep work properly, we also, we also added a new configuration option that specifies how many PGs the OSD will let trim at a time. And so I think most of the, and so with these options, then you, all the users that I'm aware of that have, that have tried them are, are really happy with the way that, that trimming works. Because previously, if you deleted a snapshot that had a lot of objects in it, then your, then your OSD should just go away for a while. We'll, we'll look at that in a minute about why that happened. But with these settings, they managed to turn it down so that it wasn't a problem. The upcoming Luminous release has the same tunables as the previous one. So there are some consequences to snapshots and the way they work. Every I.O. to an object in the snapshot that hasn't already like, been registered as part of that snapshot copies the object when you're using, when you're using XFS. So if you're benchmarking random I.O., we occasionally have people come on the list and say, hey, like, I took a snapshot and now my random I.O. FIO benchmark is running at a thousandth the speed it was before. And we're like, well, yeah, that's because you're copying every object, if every, every, every object on every access because you're taking a snapshot every second and you're never going to win that race. Um, in general, this is amortized across IOs. So, you know, as long as you don't take snapshots too fast for what your cluster can do and what workload you're applying to it, then you should be okay. We've seen people who really did try and take snapshots every minute or every five minutes on RVD volumes or something, and that didn't work out well for you. Every day probably will, assuming you have enough like slack in your cluster to do the trimming that, you, that you're going to want to do if you're doing that. And snapshot trimming costs sort of a little more than a client op for every object with fresh data in the snapshot. So again, it's amortized, but if you take a snapshot on an RBD volume of 1,000 objects and you write to every object and then you delete it, you've got about 1,000 client IOPS, maybe 2,000. And if you have 10 primary OSDs with a hard drive that can do 100 IOPS, then that's one second of cluster throughput to, to delete that snapshot. Now, assuming you've set up, the, you, you're using the defaults or have set up the, sna the snapshot trimming tunables well, that'll be, you know, not a whole second, but it'll be distributed. But it is, you know, you sort of need to think about it in, in, ter in those ter terms when you're doing your cluster capacity planning. You'd better not create a cluster and then have an hour's worth of snapshot creates and an hour's worth of snapshot trimming every day if your cluster is running at full capacity for 23 hours out of the day. And you need to design the system for, to do that. Ah, Sage. Yeah, sorry. So if I haven't been clear enough about that, the copy goes away with BlueStore. BlueStore does block allocation, so you only write the fresh data into, into, into BlueStore. When you delete the data, you only delete the data that isn't used by a current snapshot in BlueStore. BlueStore makes everything wonderful and is full of rainbows and unicorns and ponies. <laughs> but most of you are, are not running BlueStore, and, are gonna, and if you're running a cluster, you're going to be using FileStore for a while, so know these things. So that's how snapshots work in CephFS and RVD. We also have this other thing called pool snapshots that I made in my first year or two and that I'm a little sad about. The goal with pool snapshots was to make things easy for admins. I think that these might have existed before RBD was even a thing, but after we'd created the Rados Gateway. So the, it was like, you know, maybe we got, want to make this thing so that admins can take copies of the current state of their cluster. And we wanted to use the same implementation inside of the OSD. And so we were like, you know, a really easy way to do it is to just put the snapshot in the OSD map and let it spread. There were some problems with that, though. Unlike with our other snapshotting mechanisms, pool snapshots are not point in time. If you have two RBD volumes attached to a, to a VM, 
and one of them's your like database log and one of them's your database data <laughs> and you do a pool snapshot, those are not point in time consistent and if you do a recovery from your pool snapshot, your database is gonna be very angry at you. The snapshot is just sort of spread virally as OSD maps get pushed out between the OSDs and between the clients and their OSDs. And it additionally, it makes the OSD map bigger for every, every snapshot that exists in the system. And most crucially, it doesn't work at all with self-managed snapshots. So you can't use the real RVD snapshots that are per volume and that are used for some of the replication systems that people have built up in things. And you can't use it on a pool where you're using CephFS. And also, because it's pool-wide, every object in the pool, snapshot trimming is a lot more expensive than on a, on a snapshot basis than, than when doing most snapshot removals. We, we throttle a lot more effectively now, so it's better. But it does mean that you know your pool sort of has these giant consist not consistency points where when you do remove it, it's a, it just queues up a whole lot of data throughout the system. So you might have a use case for pool snapshots. There are some, but they're unlikely to to be what you're after if, if you're looking at them. And so you should talk to the list about what your goals are, and or you know your support guy or whatever about what your goals are and what the right way to accomplish them is. There are also a few pain points in CephFS with snapshots I should call out. Hard links and snapshots do not interact at all right now. If I create a file in my directory or in my home dir, and then I hard link it from somewhere else, and then I take a snapshot of the somewhere else, it does not copy the current state of the file. It's just a thing that hasn't been done. It's kind of hard. We know how to fix it, but, it, but it's still queued up because other things like the multiple active MDS has got prioritized the last planning round. There are also a few hard edges and some narrow bugs bugs when you have, the, have various combinations of features turned on. So snapshots aren't considered generally stable yet. I'm not sure if the file system team is turning them on for Luminous or not, but, as, but they aren't in Jewel, certainly. That said, you know, they're coming along. They're nice most of the time, and there are some good use cases for them, which I should have ordered next, but are instead the next slide. So in RVD, there's a, there's a web, or there's a doc page about how to use snapshots. And it's pretty simple. You run the RVD command, and you say snap create this snapshot on this RVD volume, and it takes a snapshot of the image. You can also clone the image from a snapshot, and so when you do that, you've got your image foo and your image bar, and you've, and, or sorry, you've got your image foo and you've snapshotted it. You can make an image bar that's in a different pool somewhere that might have you know, different, different speed requirements or different, consist or different durability requirements or something, and, or it might just be like you want to copy, and then you have this new image bar that starts off the same as, our, as foo was at its, at its snapshot, but that changes as, as you do writes. There's some nice use cases associated with that. You can create a golden image, and then every time anyone wants a new, a new volume, then it's just an overlay of your golden image. You can take snapshots right before you do an OS or a big package upgrade, and if it fails, you can clone the snapshot and just resume from that snapshot. If you want to take backups for your clients without them noticing, then you can get a point in time consistent um, a point in time consistent hard drive image that's not like it's not like an FS freeze and flush that, that's safe but it is it's crash consistency and you can use that to back up somewhere else out of RBD or across to another RBD cluster or something and you can use it in various ways to transparently migrate VMs around between pools or clusters and CephFS it's a simple maker by default, everyone on the, on the cluster can create snapshots, but you can limit it by UID range if you want to. You can sort of use it for anything that you want read-only data for. You can create point-in-time backups of a directory before making big changes. That does work with open files as long as the data has been put into CephFS. The clients will flush it out correctly. You can use it as a poor man's git that works okay with binary data. You can use it as a basis for copying consistent data around. You can take snapshots of the home directory every day to prevent user to allow your to allow your users to ask you to recover files for them or to do it themselves. And the Project Manila files as a service system in, in OpenStack uses snapshots for whatever it uses snapshots for, but this is for that. 
And we have come to the end of my slides a little early, so I'll take questions now. Or maybe I won't. <laughs> Uh, I think I saw a blueprint for uh, Rattles Gateway snapshots, but the, it, it never went anywhere. Is that something that people are asking for, so you can kind of buck, back up S3 buckets? I, I am not familiar with any requests for that. I think there had been some requests for it in the past, but they added the S3 versioning interface, so you can do versioned objects that just don't disappear, and I think it pretty much died away after that. If people are interested, you should put in those tickets. I, I don't know how they do it, but it definitely could be done in a couple of different ways. I had another question, if you don't mind. Um, if you snapshot a directory tree with accidentally some humongous file in it, it is there any way to reason about where, where did all my space go? You know, I, it's hidden away in snapshots. Is there some way to kind of see in there? That, that's one of the rough edges in the file system right now. There, there are. Um, CEPH supports a thing called RSTAT, a thing that we call recursive statistics, where usage information gets propagated up into directories. So you can look at a directory, instead of it being four kilobytes, because that's the size of a block, it'll say, oh, hey, there's 10 gigabytes of data in my descendants. And so I think probably what I'll end up doing is hooking snapshots into that to have like a snapshot RSTAT saying, the snapshots underneath here have this much data. But it's not implemented yet. All right. Thanks very much. Yep. Hey. Hi. Nice presentation. Uh, I have a question. Um, so you mentioned that you use um, the RBD command tool to create a snapshot. Um, can you use uh, things like, can you bypass it RBD tool and use like lift CFD or lift RB, uh, RBD to, yeah. to also initiate that snapshot? Yeah, I don't work with RBD too much, so honestly I just went to the snapshot page and looked for an example of how to do them, but yeah, those are all, that's implemented in terms of libRBD. It's all programmatically accessible. It just, it's pretty simple was, was the point of that command. Thank you. Yep. Um, so the OSD map has a, a, a list of snapshots that are deleted, basically, stored as a interval set, you said. Is that, does that just grow with the number of snapshots, or is there some sort of trimming for that? Um, so the interval set is a particular kind of data structure where, and, and, and it's nice for snapshots because if you've deleted all of the snapshots 0 to 100, it says, all right, th then that takes two integers to represent. It says, it says starting at 0, we've deleted, then, it, then this set contains 100 en entries. So as long as you delete snapshots from the tail moving forward, then it's a very small structure. If you have a more complicated backup system, it can grow, a, it can grow more. It hasn't been a big problem for users yet, although, yes, there are going to be changes post-luminous to how, how the snapshot, deleted snapshots are stored in the, in the map. So it's bounded by the number of snapshots left that haven't been deleted. It's bounded by, the, actually, it's bounded by the number of holes in your deleted snapshot set. <laughs> Are there plans for the ability to create a consistent snapshot of multiple RBD volumes? I believe that's a blueprint in progress, but I can't talk about it very much. Okay. There's a mechanism. Yeah, um, from Mirantis, Sage? Someone at Mirantis is working on a consistency groups feature for RBD volumes. Oh, oh, Jason's there too. Sorry, Jason. You should ask him about things like that. <laughs> All right. I guess I'll let you go early, and feel free to come up and ask me or Jason or Sage some questions. Thanks so much, guys. Thank you.